We're happy to have you all here today, and we're really happy to have Deborah Siegel, from, uh, formerly from the IMF, with us today, and Leonardo Stanley from uh, the Center for Economic Development and Societal Change in, in uh, Buenos Aires with us today. Uh, we're calling our event Capital Account Regulations in the Trading System, and don't worry, I'll tell you what a capital account regulation is if it's not something that you think about. Um, about every day, but uh, in a lot of ways we're celebrating a new report that you can get a free copy of in the back called uh, Capital Account Regulations and the Trading System, a Compatibility Review. I guess the, uh, the bumper sticker uh, punchline of it is um, there's a little bit of a concern that uh, we have two different global regimes that uh, might be conflicting. We've got a newly emerging international monetary and financial regime that uh, is reshaping itself in the wake of the financial cr crisis. And uh, a number of the authors in this report are concerned about the extent to which many of these new regulations and new forms of, uh, of advice coming out of the crisis might clash with countries' existing commitments under international trade treaties, such as the World Trade Organization, uh, and bilateral investment treaties or free trade agreements. Um, let me uh, introduce the speakers, introduce the Part E task force, tell you a little bit about our um, our general findings, and then I'm going to do like a five-minute 101 about uh, some of the key things in the trading system in case my two friends start uh, throwing out lots of acronyms and things about trade law or financial law that, uh, that, uh, that, none of, that not everyone is uh, thinking about every single day and doesn't have books about these things on their coffee table. I mean, we're really expressing concern here about the extent to which financial law and the regimes around it are clashing with trade law in the regimes around those. So we're going to hear from two exciting folks. Uh, one is Deborah E. Siegel. She's the former senior counsel at the International Monetary Fund. She spent 20 years there working in the legal department in the Office of the Internal, uh, Internal Audit. Her speci specialities include international trade with a focus on the relationship between the WTO and the IMF, uh, as well as anti-corruption laws and ethics for government officials. Uh, she worked in the private sector uh, before and uh, has, uh, has degrees from Washington Law School, New York University, and Tufts University. Um, Leonardo Stanley is an economist uh, at the, uh, in the Department of Economics for the Center for the Study of State and Society, or CEDES, in, uh, in Argentina, Buenos Aires. Uh, he's a researcher at the Mercosur Economic Research Network and teaches undergraduate and postgraduate uh, courses in the School of Economics at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, he's got a number of publications and is working on these issues um, for a long time. So these two folks were both part of, uh, of this task force that we put together um, that came out of the, uh, of the financial crisis. Boston University has been a uh, so many fun and interesting things have happened here across the university since the crisis. We, we wouldn't, uh, it's too bad that it took a crisis to bring us all together, but uh, as, as uh, Cynthia noted, one of the interesting things that's come out of the crisis is that there's been the emergence of this Center for Finance, Law, and Policy. Um, uh, right after the crisis, the Part E Center was having uh, events about the crisis. There are events at the Business School. There are events at the Morin Center for Financial Law. There's events in the Economics Department. And you know, enough people started going to all these things to try to figure this whole thing out. And uh, we realized, wow, Boston University has a lot of both professional researchers and academics and students who are doing research and are really interested in all this stuff. And uh, I think we've all sh can credit ourselves for having a, a real interesting set of conversations about all these things to try to to try to rethink it. And um, the Center for Finance, Law, and Policy is one of the one of the co-sponsors that we have uh, have here today, and they they supported this report to a, to a certain extent. Um, right after the crisis, one of the things that has been done at the Part E Center is that myself and the former finance minister of Colombia put together something called a task force on regulating global capital flows. Uh, uh, foreign capital flows or cross-border financial flows, bonds, dividends, derivatives, currency trades, and so forth are things that can move around the world economy quite quickly um, and on many levels are very important for investment and for employment and for productive development in, uh, in economies. But uh, depending upon the nature of your financial system and the scale of how much of this moves in in different countries, it also can, can, be a, can foster financial instability. <coughs> 
Um, capital flows played a big role in the financial crisis in the United States, a major role in the financial crisis of the Eurozone, uh, in the Eurozone, and even more so in crises in Brazil, in Argentina, uh, and certainly in East Asia in the 1990s, and certainly in Latin America in the 1980s. Um, and in the wake of the crisis, myself and, and Jose Antonio Campo said, let's, let's rethink the extent to which countries should regulate cross-border financial flows. To what extent should they regulate these things? What are some examples of countries that should and uh, that have been doing this? And what are some recommendations on how to do it? Because it had sort of fallen out of favor in the 1990s and so forth. As a matter of fact, so much so that there was a move at the International Monetary <coughs> Fund to uh, change the Articles of Agreement to, uh, to basically make it somewhat illegal uh, across, the across the world economy. Um, so we uh, convened here at Boston University um, a, uh, a task force that, con that uh, consisted of uh, folks from the Asian Development Bank, uh, former finance minister of, Co of, of Colombia, um, uh, folks from Central Bank, some from the United Nations, uh, IMF officials, uh, former WTO folks, and some, acad and some academics here, and we uh, put out this report on regulating capital flows where we recommended that uh, in the wake of the financial crisis that regulating cross-border finance is justified now more than ever, that there's a lot of ex examples of countries that are doing it successfully, um, and that, um, that with caution and with, with precision that countries should start to rethink the, the extent to which they should regulate capital flows. Interestingly, at the same time, the International Monetary Fund also had its own official reassessment of this whole idea. And in December of 2012, they came out with a quote-unquote institutional view, which said that it's still the, the International Monetary Fund's view that eventually countries should liberalize their capital account, meaning allow foreign finance to move in and out of countries. But in order to um, maintain financial stability, under certain circumstances, regulations on cross-border financial flows, which they call capital flow management measures, which are traditionally had been referred to as capital controls, um, might be um, justified in some instances, and in fact, uh, under their surveillance operations, or what are, are called Article 4 reports, they may even be recommending that some countries use these regulations. And there's some students in, the in, in one of the classes that's, uh, that's here that have looked at some of these Article reports and, and have found that the IMF has been recommending that countries regulate cross-border finance since about 2008 pretty regularly in a lot of countries that have had a, a lot of buildup of this kind of uh, of this kind of finance. So after that task force report was, uh, was done, um, a lot of us uh, discovered a debate that's been going on in uh, mainly with the United States that uh, in United States trade agreements we make it a little difficult for a country to regulate cross-border finance. And so we decided to put together another, uh, and a lot of this was manifest in Argentina. After Argentina's crisis, they did a number of things to try to uh, mitigate the effects of the crisis. And a year or so later, they had over 40 different suits against them uh, for potential violations of their different trade commitments. And so we convened a different group, um, the, a group for the task force, the first task force report were mainly economists and central bankers. For this one, we put together legal scholars, folks in central banks, um, uh, Deborah Siegel from, from, the, from the IMF, a, a lawyer at the World Trade Organization, and we asked, asked the question, to what extent are these new regulations compatible with the trading regime? Um, and we found, uh, and this will come out in the two papers, that there's a lot of potential clashes between WTO commitments and the ability to regulate capital, uh, capital flows, but, uh, but not as accentuated as they are under many of the bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements, especially those with, uh, those with the United States. It's a little bit of an open question about the World Trade Organization, but it's, the, it's hard to find a legal scholar um, uh, or a finance ministry that will say that, uh, that uh, regulating cross-border finance isn't in conflict with, say, their treaty with the United States, with the exception of the South Koreans, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, and so after doing this compatibility review in this report, uh, since we had all these incredible finance ministry, IMF, uh, WTO folks all in the room, uh, we came up with a set of recommendations on what, uh, what countries might want to do, what the IMF might want to do, what uh, trade regimes might want to do to try to reconcile these, and we can get to that later. So I'm going to turn it all over to, uh, to, my, um, to my two colleagues, but let me just do a little bit of trade policy background uh, in case... Uh, uh, in case these folks use acronyms that uh, you don't think about every single day, um, is that when we talk about the trade regime, uh, we're talking about a multilateral trade regime which is governed by the World Trade Organization, which came out of the Bretton Woods Agreements in the 1940s. Um, there was a, an attempt to create an international trade organization um, but uh, heck, in a, just a couple of weeks, they created the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and an entire uh, exchange rate regime for the world. Um, and they didn't get the third thing that they wanted, the International Trade Organization. Um, but uh, they did set up something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was a floating negotiation forum to try to get free trade and a uniform playing field for the trading system over time. You know thinking about in the wake of the financial crisis, could world leaders ever come together and create four institutions that were going to last 75 years? I don't think any of us would make that bet. So we won't, we won't beat them up for not uh, creating the ITO became manifest as the World Trade Organization, not until t 1995 as a, as a result of the, of the Uruguay round. And so one of the things, when you think of trade, you know, so why are we having a conversation about trade and finance? Well, trade is very little about trade and goods anymore. When we think about trade, and unfortunately one of the things that we found is that when a trade negotiator from Malaysia or Chile thinks about trade, they're thinking about wine tariffs in the United States. They're thinking about uh, car tariffs and or, or trying to lower tariffs to get more shoes into their country. Um, and that is what the trading regime was about uh, for at least uh, through the 1980s. But as tariffs and quotas and subsidies in goods have gone down over the past 50 or 60 years, uh, the private sector and governments have noticed that there are things that are non-tariff barriers that are domestic regulations that impact trade. And one of the key areas has been in services. Uh, if, you're, if you're older, uh, like myself, we used to talk about tradables and non-tradables. <clears throat> and the non-tradables were the service sectors. But now, in a globalized world, the service, service is trade. Anyone here uh, coming to Boston University from another, uh, from another school, uh, from another country? So, you folks are services exports. We are, uh, we are exporting our services here as uh, Boston University professors to your country. And in the balance of payments, your tuition payments to Boston uh, fall under mode, one, mode, mode, uh, mode two uh, services commitments because you are consuming, uh, consuming things abroad. Um, and heck, if you think about the two guiding principles in the trade regime, one of them is most favored nation. So if we're all members of a treaty, if I have a tariff on wine in Professor Bodie's uh, country, and he, his is uh, from France because I really like French wine, but if Leonardo here is from uh, Argentina, uh, if I have a, a, a tariff of 4% on French wine, uh, I can't charge the Argentines 6% for their Malbec, right? Because I like the French the best, um, I have to treat everybody favorably. Now, that, to create a level playing field for the global uh, economy, there's also another principle in, in trade policy called national treatment, which means that I can't treat my national sectors. Uh, I have to treat them the same that I treat my other fellow countries. So if Susan is from the United States and she's from Northern California, I can't have a 4% tariff on French and uh, Argentine wine, and then give her big subsidies for Northern California Pinot, right? Because therefore all my consumers would, uh, would unfairly be attracted towards Susan's because hers would be cheaper. So I'm trying to keep a level playing field between these two, uh, between other countries in the world and all of my, uh, all of my, uh, all of my sectors in, in my own country. Those two are, you know, these law, sorry for the lawyers in the room, I mean, these things are 2,000 pages. But those are the two guiding principles throughout the whole thing and a long run to commitment to try to bring along in that, in that playing field a long run commitment to try to keep barriers to bring them down. 
So to bring those tariffs eventually down to zero, to bring those restrictions on, uh, on education uh, to, to basically zero. So heck, if you're from Romania, you want to come here, you can come here, but uh, I'm not going to make it harder from Tati for Tatiana from Mexico uh, to come here. And so that's the, those are the long run guiding principles of the World Trade Organization. Now under the World Trade Organization, there's been a proliferation uh, especially over the past 15 years of regional trade agreements or what some people call free trade agreements um, and bilateral investment treaties. Um, the WTO, I guess one other feature to note, is that uh, it's, it's got over a hundred and, what are we, 160, some, 160 something measures and uh, when they come together in what's called a round, we're in the middle of one, the end of one, the beginning of one now, we're not quite sure, uh, when they come together in a round, they're basically renegotiating the terms of the treaty. Um, and when they do that, they have to do that by one country, one vote. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, when there was just six or seven countries that uh, won the war and basically had the lion's share of the world market, these agreements were not that hard. Now that you've got 160 countries with different politics in their own country, different <coughs> comparative advantages and so forth, the process has become very slow. Um, and not every country, perhaps not any country, gets exactly what they want when they have to ne negotiate with 160 or so. So one of the stated policies in the United States has been something called competitive liberalization. We're going to find countries that, uh, that, that agree with us on trade policy and sign deals with them. And hopefully, by uh, signing enough of those, we are going to get some of the countries that don't necessarily agree with us at the WTO to eventually have to sort of cave in because we've surrounded them with uh, deals that, uh, that, uh, that they said they didn't like. Um, uh, the big countries that have, been, that have formed a coalition at the World Trade Organization that uh, hasn't seen eye to eye with U.S. trade policies are largely these BRICS countries. You know, South Africa being perhaps the most uh, important at the WTO but supported by India, China, and Brazil and a, and a host of other a host of other countries have been part of, uh, I'm, not, I'm not blaming them, you could, every, uh, the blame goes to 160 countries, but the, but the whole thing has been slow. So the U.S. has said, okay, well, let's call up Colombia. They see eye to eye on a lot of these things. They have comparative advantages that they want to sell things to us. We want to sell things to them. We'll do a deal with them. There's been over 50 of them in the past 15 or so years. Uh, in the United States and it's triggered European deals, it's triggered Asian deals, there's Latin American deals. Uh, in this hemisphere we call it the spaghetti bowl of uh, tr uh, interlocking trade treaties. In, the, uh, in Asia they refer to it as the noodle bowl of interlocking trade treaties and nobody wants to be the guy at the border that has to say, okay Strom, your ship just came in and where did you stop on your way here? Because each box needs to be inspected for every single trade treaty that it might go under. Um, so there's been these prolifer proliferation of these, and these go much deeper than, than what you get at the WTO. Uh, they still have these two principles, but one of the things um, that they require is that all transfers of all covered investments, derivatives, profits, bonds, currencies, uh, have to move in and out of the country free freely and, uh, and without delay. Um, perhaps the, the United States is really engaged in two big ones. Um, Obama in his uh, inauguration speech, or was it in his acceptance speech, uh, or in the State of the Union, announced a, a trade deal with the, uh, with, the, with the Europeans, the transatlantic trade deal. They say he's going to complete in two years. And uh, the Obama administration has been doing something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which deals with a number of Pacific Rim countries. It's been going on for quite a long time, but just this morning Japan officially entered it. And so this is a major, major uh, Pacific deal uh, as well. Interestingly, China is not part of it. Um, uh, and so the U.S. is engaged in this. So that's, uh, I hope that's enough basic background. I don't want to uh, take away from these two really interesting people, but I think this might help us put some of this in context. And again, what the task force, what these two authors talk about um, was, to what extent is this emerging noodle bowl, spaghetti bowl of regional trade agreements and new regulations at the World Trade Organization, to what, ex uh, to what extent are those trade deals that now have financial services components in them um, because not only are these services and education part of these deals now, so would banking services and financial services that are cross borders are part of these deals. So to what extent are commitments that countries are making in the trade regime 
on the liberalization of financial services, on regulations related to financial services, on making transfers of funds move freely without delay in, with trade deals, to what extent are those compatible with new ideas at the International Monetary Fund, with the Dodd-Frank bill, with, uh, with the things at the FSB and the G20? That's what we looked at. These folks have the answers. I think um, uh, Leonardo Stanley from Argentina will go first and outline um, uh, some of the papers on uh, capital account regulations or cross-border financial regulations and the WTO. And uh, Deborah Spiegel, Siegel will talk about um, capital account regulations and uh, regional trade agreements and BITs, especially those of, of the United States. Okay. Okay. First of all, uh, well, thanks. Uh, uh, Kevin and thanks Boston University for hosting me and inviting to to stay with you and and I will just uh, talk very briefly on three uh, I mean trying to to focus on on three uh, specific uh, points uh, first on God's uh, weakness I mean general agreement on trade and service weakness later on uh, the advantage uh, given by GATS in contrast to uh, free trade agreements and bilateral in, uh, investment treaties. And finally, some conclusions. Uh, so uh, I will begin with that, and I should uh, apologize in advance for my English. I mean, I'm very bad, <laughs> and I temporarily <coughs> export, like for mold two or <laughs> of that. So I, um, well, uh, I would say that the recent financial turmoil has helped um, to highlight the utmost importance uh, of an effective financial regulation, as uh, we are uh, observing, including controls on short-term international capital movements. As the experience of uh, emerging BRICS have shown, the introduction of capital account regulation cars has also proved effective to prevent crisis, a sort of macroprudential regulation and to alter the temporal uh, structure of capital flows. Unfortunately, sensible measures like this could be challenged under the WTO uh, GATS legal framework. The obligations set forth by the GATS fall essentially in two categories, the general obligation and the specific commitments. The former are automatic binding on members from the moment in which the WT agreement is signed, is being signed. The specific commitments are instead binding as uh, obligation that each country decides voluntarily to, uh, to assume or to undertake, particularly with regard to market ac access and national treatment. In other words, specific sector commitments determine the liberalization impact of the, uh, of the agreement for this member country. For this reason, this clause has been uh, has become the main source of controversy of subsequent negotiation rounds. In particular, state members who have committed to grant free access to financial service markets under Mode One and Mode Three are, in fact, requests to liberalize capital flows, which are strictly connected <coughs> to the service provider. As a consequence. A number of concerns arise regarding the ability of nation states to deploy cars, as in, in other words, to deploy capital controls, while keeping their commitments under the guts. In other words, the conflict between re-regulation and existing WTO rules remain, as highlighted by the 2009 UN Stiglitz report. Nonetheless, it is fair to mention that WTO members do have some space to introduce this capital accounts regulations. In particular, three specific exceptions allow members to include, uh, to, to elude, sorry, GATS limitation as follows. First, member states are allowed to introduce capital controls satisfying an, EF, EF, IM, sorry, an IMF request. According to Article uh, 15.9, uh, uh, Article A of the GATT, I mean, of the general agreement on tariff and trade, a measure restricting capital transaction that is consistent with an IMF obligation should not lead to a finding of breach of GATS WTO provision. A second exception is allowed in order to save who are members stable balances of payments. It follows that members are not only permitted to impose temporary trade restriction, but they could also introduce current account restriction service related payments. 
However, as mentioned by Todd Tucker in Chapter 2, there are a number of incompatibilities between the ability to regulate cross-border finance and disciplines under the World Trade Organization. The GATS balance of payment software does not adequately warranty nations the possibility to regulate both the inflow and outflow of capital because there is no reference to derogations to maintain financial stability. Thirds and finally, controls could also be introduced in order to ensure the integrity and stability of the financial service sector, the so-called prudential carve-out clause. This prudential carve-out clause could be adopted regardless of the member state's specific commitments on market access and national treatments. The problem is some lack of definition in the, uh, the prudential carve-out provision has also problems quickly. In Article 12, the GATS does allow to use cars for crisis management purpose and on a temporary basis. But as detailed uh, in the book by Andres Arauz at Chapter 4, GATS precludes its introduction as macroprudential tools for crisis prevention. In Chapter 5, interestingly, Luis Fernando da Paula and Daniela Magalhães Prats illustrate the distinctive institutional path followed by Brazil. Brazilian authorities have only made commitments on their Mode 3 commercial presence and limit the entry of foreign banks and this, as the admissions process was carried out on a case-by-case -case basis. But those were the, the disadvantages to some extent, so the problems we could find at, uh, at GATS WTO. I, uh, there are also some yeah, aspects which uh, <coughs> led us to support to some extent this these legal frameworks. Uh, in the introductory chapter, Kevin Gallagher and I have underlined a series of advantages uh, favoring GATS WTO over a myriad of preferential trade agreements. Under GATS, all commitments are made under the, me the mechanism of positive list, as opposed to the neg negative list approach followed by bilateral investment uh, treaties or preferential trade agreements, uh, FTAs. Um, any dispute arising from the imposition of regulatory measures would be settled under the dispute settlement understanding mechanism. There's a second advantage. In contrast to the state, to uh, uh, sorry, a uh, 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 sort of state to state dispute settlement space that contrasts to the uh, investor state dispute settlement mechanisms included uh, under the BITS or uh, FTAs. Uh, above all, in spite of all these uh, imperfections we were talking in the, the first uh, part, the WTO remains a democratic space, as highlighted by Kevin, from and from the principle that each country has a vote um, and remains equally representative. In other words, cars have been actually more than limited by preferential trade agreement, as stressed by Hector Torres at Chapter 3. Uh, as stated by Ana Maria Viterbo in Chapter 1, at the end, GATS does not contain a general obligation to liberalize capital flows. Therefore, unless a member has voluntarily chosen to be bound as to, to a schedule as a specific commitment, the country remains free to adopt capital controls without violating any uh, GATS rules. This author, Ana Maria, also remarked the possibility of transforming GATS into a code of conduct for capital control by virtue of clarifying or transforming some of the GATS exceptions uh, cited before. So, in conclusion, the uh, World Trade Organization development objectives remain partially unfulfilled. Uh, in this sense, the f uh, uh, we are trying to, to, to give some last words. I mean, the founding fathers of the Bretton Woods Institution share a common vision. Uh, in order to prevent a new phase of economic instability, they instead uh, intended to create a rule-based um, multilateral framework, imposing clear obligations uh, to the contracting parties and providing the adoption of protectionist and bigger by neighbor policies. And the Bretton Woods systems stay reminded free to introduce restrictions to correct imbalance created by capital inflows. Unfortunately, since the 70s, the international uh, f financial system turned bolder. GATS and preferential trade agreement liberalization of trade and investment in financial service has significantly helped the adoption of very risk strategies and business models that eventually fueled the financial crisis. <coughs> 
current negotiations to liberalize financial services as part of the WTO DOA talks on GATS and multilateral negotiations for a re redesign the service agreement are still based on a pre-crisis GATS model that honored and ever promote the light touch regulation of the banking system and financial liberalization. In other words, it must be argued that for the WTO GATS systems, the stability of the financial system might become a greater concern than the openness of the financial system at times. But the still liberalization remains embedded, embedded in, its all, in its long run goal. I mean, it remains liberalized. The, 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 the objective. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Leonardo. Before we go to, to Deborah Siegel, let me um, let me add. A, a, you mentioned some terms that I guess I should I should uh, I should highlight and maybe maybe try to summarize a, a little bit. And so we've got these two regimes. We've got the World Trade Organization, uh, not it, World Trade Organization, which is the multilateral trading regime, and then all these uh, bilateral uh, deals and uh, and regional deals. Under the WTO, as Leonardo said, there is the general agreement of tariffs and uh, trade and services which deals with all sorts of services like the education, but also financial services and banking services. Now when you sign up at the WTO, uh, you, uh, under a negotiation under the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, you can have a negotiation about liberalizing financial services. Uh, he, he used the term positive list, right, so to, to uh, make, that, uh, make that accessible to, to all of us. That just means if um, if I'm negotiating with Strom Thacker's country and, um, and we want to have a discussion about the liberalization of financial services in his country, I am going to ask him, I'm the United States, he's say Mexico, I'm going to ask him to liberalize his financial services sector. And he will put that on a positive list, meaning positive. Positively, yes, if he agrees with me, he will list that as a sector that he will liberalize. Um, he, um, he, may put, he may put a limit on that. Some, caveats and footnotes about certain things under certain circumstances where he wouldn't liberalize it, but in general, he will list that. That stands in stark uh, contrast to what, what might come up in the next presentation, although what, what uh, Leonardo said is that say I'm negotiating a deal with Colombia, with uh, Juan Blanco from Colombia, and um, the regional trade deals usually have, uh, bilateral investment deals have something called a negative list. So we're, we're assuming that you're liberalizing everything except for the sector that you list. Um, and so he might say, I'm going to liberalize education, health, but not finance. Um, and so it's a little bit of a dynamic. That's what he was talking about with positive lists. Leonardo also talked about inflows and outflows. So there are different reasons to uh, regulate inflows and outflows. In general, you want investment to come in and out of a country the, uh, uh, with, the, with the market determining it. But in certain circumstances, there can be surges of inflows of capital especially non-foreign direct investment, short-term money such as currencies, derivatives, stocks and bonds. A lot of it can build up in a surge that can go into a country really fast. That can increase the exchange rate. It can move into asset sectors and cause asset bubbles, which if there's a sudden stop in investment, okay, the money could move out of the country and the those assets, the collateral under those assets could collapse, the exchange rate could collapse, uh, and there could be severe uh, financial damage. Uh, on the inflow side, the damage can be in terms of uh, currency appreciation, and therefore you can't export things, and you get the, uh, the, uh, the credit bubbles. And when there's a big devaluation, uh, that can obviously have severe impacts on the other end. To put this in, in the real world, um, uh, 2010, Brazil was really worried about, uh, about a surge in inflows. They had a 40% appreciation of their currency. They had a massive credit bubble in the real estate and in the stock market. And they were worried that too much inflows were coming in from monetary policy in the United States, that they couldn't handle it. Their exporters, they're a big exporting country. Their exporters couldn't compete with other countries that sell other goods. Um, and a lot of research has shown that because of that, it's one of the reasons why the country's slowing down now. Well, what they tried to put in place tariffs, uh, or excuse me, taxes, on some of those inflows and on foreign exchange derivatives to try to slow down the buildup of that risk. Um, a present-day example is South Korea. 
Uh, one of the big things in the news this week is, uh, is the massive monetary policy in Japan that has uh, brought the value of the yen down and interest rates in Japan very, very low. So a lot of countries are borrow uh, investors are borrowing money in yen in Japanese banks and investing in places like South Korea. So the South Korean yuan is uh, appreciating significantly and there's a buildup of risk there. And so South Korea has uh, regulations on foreign exchange derivatives and, uh, uh, and on certain kinds of bonds and stocks coming into the country to try to stem that. Those are regulations on inflows that are usually temporary and countercyclical to try to, be, to go in during a surge to try to temper the effects of a surge. Now he mentioned outflows, that's where you can think Iceland and Cyprus. The, the world is giving us plenty of examples of these things, right? So outflows regulations are often when there's a massive devaluation of the currency and there's a lot of capital flight from the banks from the country and there's a run on banks leave, leaving the country that could put the country in, uh, uh, in dire straits and often a, a, a banking authority or the International Monetary Fund will um, will recommend that they limit the amount or tax the amount of uh, capital leaving the country to try to stop a, 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 a disintegration of their banking system and a, and a massive drop in their exchange rate. Why does a massive drop in your exchange rate really hurt? Um, isn't, that what you, isn't that what those Brazilian exporters wanted uh, when their exchange rate was expensive? Well, if you have a lot of debt and your debt is denominated in international dollars or in euro or in yen, and the value of your local currency goes down, your balance sheet or the amount of debt that you owe has just exploded. Okay, and so you've, uh, financial authorities are really concerned about that. And so when we talk about does the WTO or does a regional trade agreement or a bilateral investment treaty give countries the proper policy space for what the South Koreans, the Brazilians are doing, and as we'll hear that the International Monetary Fund is starting to recommend, we're asking to what extent are those kinds of instruments, uh, instruments permissible, permissible. To summarize, Leonardo, at the World Trade Organization, it's 100% permissible if you haven't listed liberalizing financial services in your general agreement on trade and services commitments. So under your GATS commitments, when I called up Strom and asked him to liberalize his financial <coughs> services sector, if he said no, like Brazil did, and said, but I'll do the health sector, um, then he can do whatever he wants. And that's actually, the, we have a chapter in here by two Brazilians, and Brazil has not made commitments uh, in financial services under the GATS, and so they can do whatever they want. Um, also under the GATS, if... Um, Tatiana from, uh, from, from Colombia uh, had said, or from Chile had said, yes, I will liberalize financial services, but I'm going to put a limit on them. We have this law at the central bank called the Encaje that allows us to put a tax on inflows for a short <coughs> period of time when there's this kind of buildup. We'll liberalize, but we want to reserve the right to use that law. You can do that too under the WTO. Um, even if Susan, um, was um, uh, Colombia and liberalized under the WTO, meaning listed its financial services, didn't put a limit on it like the Chileans did, um, uh, and she decided to use some sort of a regulation on inflows or outflows. Uh, Leonardo talked about two different exceptions in the WTO that you might be able to get through. One of them is the balance of payments exception, which says that under extreme financial difficulties, you may be able, you could, you can use these, uh, use these measures. And another one is what he referred to as the prudential exception, which says, well, to try to, uh, uh, to try to deal with with issues for prudential reasons, a nation may make certain interventions uh, into uh, certain violations of their commitments. And many of the legal scholars and central bankers on the WTO one are not, not much of a consensus there. Some of them are really concerned that the balance of payments only allows an outflow sort of Icelandic situation because it says under extreme lawyers really argue. We had to watch the lawyers argue about two words in a paragraph for two hours. But uh, under extreme circumstances, <laughs> um, that says more to, to most in the legal community that, uh, okay, the Cyprus-Iceland kind of thing is okay but not the uh, tax of, that Brazil has or the foreign exchange derivative regulations that the, uh, that the South Koreans have. Um, sorry to, to, uh, to go on and on, and we'll, we'll leave questions till after, I'm sorry, but um, just to help clarify and accentuate, uh, Deborah Siegel, from, formerly from the IMF. 
thanks everyone for coming and thanks to Kevin and Cynthia back there for <coughs> inviting me. Um, it's an advantage to go last because you have a lot of background that's already been given to you. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about the relationship of the trade side to the IMF. Uh, as I was listening to this, I decided to start with a point that I had in my prepared marks a little later, but it occurs to me that it's important background to notice that in some ways, to use a cliche, we're talking about apples and oranges. Because let's look at what you want in a trade agreement. If you come from, and let's take the US, from um, you know the trading agency of the US called USTR, your mission, what is your mission? Your mission is to open markets in foreign countries for US products. And as part of that mission, you want to protect U.S. interests when they go into those foreign markets. You want to make sure that the services that you're provided there will be allowed to be distributed. You want to make sure that the money for those services goes in and then the payments can come out. And if your investors are in that country, you want them to be protected from any controls on them benefiting. That is their mission. That's, let's say, the apple. What's the IMF? Well, that's the orange. The IMF is an international organization. It has a charter that establishes it, so in a way it's an international treaty, but most of these trade agreements do not establish an organization with an institutional role. Now, the WTO has been created as an organization, but that's another lecture on the differences of the organization. But I think it's a pretty fair summary that trade is covered by treaties, and the IMF is an organization with its own mission. But its mission is not that of promoting the interests of any individual government. Its, its mission is to have governments work together and to help countries in difficulty promote their abilities to relate to other countries. And that's why it has rules on exchange rates, so um, it can't um, interfere with trade by manipulating its exchange rate. Um, that's why, at, as an organization, it provides financing to members in economic distress. And that's why it has this um, function that Kevin alluded to called surveillance, which are regular meetings with countries to take stock of how things are going. And that happens to fall under Article 4 of the IMF's charter, and that's why they're called Article 4 reports. So um, what I would like to do is touch on three ways to look at how these apples and oranges interact. Um, the first is why capital control issues fit into the law and the work of the IMF at all. The second is how um, that work of the IMF is impacted by these proliferation of treaties. And the third is the flip side, whether what the IMF is doing impacts in the other way. So um, on the first topic, um, how capital controls fit into the law and work of the IMF, I want to do a, a quick primer on that law, the legal system of the IMF. And I'm going to try out this analogy. Um, several years ago, some of you may remember in this country, there was a big controversy over a um, former football player, O.J. Simpson, who had been accused of uh, murdering his wife or suspected of being involved in the death of his wife. And he was tried for murder in a criminal court but found not guilty. On the other hand, um, his wife's family won a civil suit against him. And I remember at the time a friend of my mother's asked me as a young lawyer, how could he be guilty, not guilty in criminal court, but guilty in civil court. And so of course the answer is that he wasn't guilty in civil court 
that there's different, they're both legal actions, but they're very different kinds of, of uh, standards. Um, and there's very different kinds of consequences. So in criminal court, you know, you have to really show guilt by preponderance of an evidence. And in civil court, no, I'm sorry, beyond a reasonable doubt. In civil court, um, there's a lesser standard you only have to show by preponderance of the evidence. And the consequence is not that you go to jail, but that you have monetary damages. You have to pay the victims. So um, when we look at the IMF, I want to bring that idea that there are different functions of the IMF, and they're legally pretty different from one another, but they all form part of the legal system of the IMF. Um, at, concerning capital controls, at one end of the spectrum is the funds jurisdiction, which maybe has the strongest legal consequences, but I think it covers the smallest area of the capital type of capital controls we're talking about. Um, under the funds, what we call jurisdiction, certain restrictions are actually required to be removed. And the legal consequence for not removing them is a breach of obligation. So that's pretty strong stuff. But the area of capital transactions covered are those that are included in a list of um, actually current international transactions, but that have some, some capital components. Because that strong set of the rules under the IMF's jurisdiction is really directed at at current transactions, but there are some included, and that includes amortization of principal on debt instruments, depreciation of direct investments, and normal short-term banking facilities. At the other end of the spectrum in the functions of the IMF, um, I'll, say is, it, I'll say is surveillance in this context, because it covers perhaps the broadest range of the types of capital transactions that we're looking at, but it has um, a lesser uh, legal consequence. Um, and I'll say at this stage it has a lesser legal consequence because the fund has the authority to treat those as obligations, but they haven't chosen to do so now. And instead, when they discuss these issues, it's um, in the context of policy advice. So there aren't concrete legal consequences for not following it. In the middle of these two, in terms of comparing the strength of the legal consequences and the range of capital transactions we're looking at, is the fund's financing function. And that's what I was talking about earlier. If a country is really struggling, um, and it needs um, financing from the fund to support its balance of payments and be able to pay for its imports. Um, we call, that's usually provided in, under what we call a, um, a fund-supported program, where the country and the fund work together to decide, how are we going to adjust this economy and get you out of this crisis? And we'll provide you financing in the meantime to get there, but as you've all, I'm sure, heard in the news, it's usually the program lays out a step-by-step -step process with conditions for getting the financing. So fund conditionality is yet another piece of the legal system, you know, uh, the civil law part, if you will, that if you don't meet the conditions, you don't get the financing. It's not a breach of obligation, but it, it's still a kind of legal consequence. So taking that backdrop of what the fund is and what it's trying to do, um, how do these trade agreements inter interact with that fund's legal system? Um, and um, you know, I'm talking about, in particular, bilateral investment treaties, which are usually just, just very focused on investment, and the, the acronym is BITS. 
or there are these broader um, regional agreements, Kevin mentioned, that are often called free trade agreements, and they cover a broader range of trading between the countries. But more and more now, I'd say even without exception, they have a chapter on investment or a chapter on services, like Leonardo was saying. Um, and so um, <clears throat> we have to look about how I forget which fruit I did. The apple of the trade agreements interacts with the orange of the IMF. And the concrete problem is, as Kevin said, making sure that countries still have choices, that they still have the policy space, which is you know the term of art now, to use certain um, capital controls, or now they're called CARs, or the IMF is referring to them as capital flow management le measures, the type of measures that Kevin was outlining, that as circumstances evolve in their economy and unanticipated crises develop, can countries actually use these measures? And the um, potential problem is that in the context of these trading agreements, some of them are written so starkly that they don't allow this policy space, that they articulate, um, you know, I'm not quoting, but, you know, thou shalt not ever <laughs> impose capital controls on the investments that are covered under these bits or FTAs. And some of them have the kinds of exceptions that Leonardo was referring to, and some of them don't. Most of them don't have the broad um, crisis safeguard that is in the GATT and the GATS, which says in the circumstance of a balance of payments crisis, there is permission to deviate from this rule in your trade agreements to impose these kind of restrictions. So um, if the fund is working with a member to help them resolve a financial crisis, and part of the economic program involves a condition that until we get our act, your act back together here, there may be some kind of regulations. Um, and if that member is not permitted to take that measure, it could interfere with the program and, the f and then the member would not be a, uh, have access to fund resources. So that's where I'm comparing um, the kind of bilateral self-interest that is part of a trade agreement to the work of an institution like the IMF, which has a mission to resolve crises and help countries interact with each other generally. Um, there are a couple of, of technical, legal um, conflicts under jurisdiction, but um, I'll save those for now. But I think the bigger story is in the context of surveillance. And um, I, you know, I think Kevin and Leonardo described it well that um, when the IMF meets with a country every year and they look at how that uh, their economy is evolving, how the global economy is evolving, the types of issues that Kevin mentioned and the types of, of uh, measures may be appropriate. And so if the country has made commitments under these trade agreements that essentially tie their hands without the kind of allowance for exceptions, that's when we have, uh, um, well, it's not a legal conflict, but you can see you have the apples and oranges kind of hidden up against each other. Um, the th my last topic is the converse of that, which is some concern whether what the IMF is doing is causing concern on the trade negotiation side. And my comment is that it is, is going to be pretty short because um, 
the work of the IMF is not, doesn't have the power really to interfere with these trade agreements in any way. Um, and in particular, their current set of thinking, which they have um, articulated in this so-called institutional view on these capital flow management me measures on CFMs, um, is basically a set of guidelines. And um, it's interesting to see that it was the result of, um, well, it, of bringing together a crystallization of ideas on how best to address CFMs over the years, and also almost two years' worth of papers that have been um, brought to the executive board, discussed, thrown back to the staff to think about some more, and um, culminating in the paper Kevin referred to that was finally published in December of this year. Unfortunately, like days after we had to push the button on uh, publishing the task force report. But um, so the fund now has this institutional view on capital flow management measures. But if you get a chance to read that final paper, um, it really makes very clear that this is a crystallization of ideas. It doesn't change any obligations for the fund members. It doesn't change any of the rights and obligations of members as compared to other treaties. It is meant to um, be informative and guide staff in an intelligent way to try and draw on the wisdom that has been collected over the years. So the fund will not be advising members to breach their obligations if they have them under free trade agreements. They will be working with countries to take the measures that they think are appropriate and to work around their legal obligations. Um, so my punchline is that the stark of provisions of the BITS and the FTAs interfere more with the work of the IMF um, under its legal regime than the other way around. And that's why I think m many of us in this task force recommend um, that work be done on a multilateral level to ensure that these agreements, as they are getting written going forward, do include the kind of exceptions or the kind of means to allow the policy space. And that doesn't mean to swing the pendulum all the way back to no rules on capital controls. It means to find a balanced and reasonable way to regulate flows as they are um, maybe important under specific circumstances and to find a way to address the, the apple and orange and to keep in mind the difference between bilateral self-interest and multilateral review of the global system. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks. Uh, we've got a good half hour to uh, to have questions and answers about this. I know uh, Zvi did. We're all here from different parts of the university and some other universities. So uh, when you raise your hand, uh, tell us who you are. And Cynthia has a microphone, even though we can definitely hear you. Um, they podcast for recording, purposes. recording purposes. So please, uh, yeah. can you give Zvi? Hi. Uh, my question is Who are really. You? Who are you? Oh, uh, I'm <laughs> Svi Bodhi. I'm at the School of Management. Uh, I teach finance and uh, economics, and I, I have uh, written on some of these issues, but n not at all from the legal point of view, or even from so much the policy perspective, but rather about the fundamental economic and financial science, if you will. How do these 
markets work, okay, and what is feasible and what is not feasible. So I think about things like can individual governments or even multinational institutions stop arbitrage in capital in international capital markets? And if they try to, what are the consequences? Okay. Uh, I'm what my question is how can you make rules and regulate a system where there is fundamental disagreement about how the system works among economists? And I'll, I'll just give you one example because it's, it's so fundamental and it's going on right now. The IMF traditionally, when it would come in to resolve, let's call it bankruptcy, because that's essentially what it is. When a company is on the verge of bankruptcy, it's not legally bankrupt, but it defaults on its debt or is about to default on its debt and says to the IMF, bail us out. Argentina has a lot of experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, a couple of questions arise. One is, if the IMF comes in, as it typically did, and I don't know if it does this anymore, and it says austerity is the solution. Well, we know that there are two schools, at least, of thought among economists. Those who say that austerity is what is typically needed, and those who say, no, it's the exact opposite. If you impose austerity, cut government spending, raise taxes, you're going to shrink the underlying national economy. What you want is to stimulate the growth of the underlying economy. That's the exact opposite. So that's, in essence, my question. What do you do when there's fundamental disagreement about the economic science? Let's take a couple and, and answer those as a group. Hi, my name is Gloria. I'm from the Econ Department of Economics. Um, and I have a question regarding the scope of the most favored nation clause. I understand that that is included in most of the uh, bilateral and FTAs. So um, probably I don't understand that very well, but <laughs> um, I, the, way, the way I think is um, if country A and country B have a treatment and they say, okay, for this good, we are going to have a tariff of 2%. And then country B and country C have another treaty and they say, we are going to have on the same good a uh, tariff of 1%. Then country A say, okay, we have an agreement first, so I also will get that 1%. Is that right? So um, I would like to know if uh, that uh, most favored clause has um, um, some impact on that type of uh, balance of payment exemption for, for capital controls and things like that, or um, for, for that type of, um, um, how, how can I say this? I, I, I think I understand the question. Okay. I can answer that when you're ready, if you like. Uh, thank you so much for an illuminating talk. I'm Cornel Bahn. I'm a professor at in, here at BU, International Relations. Um, I'm in general um, very intrigued by dissident uh, research coming from within the IMF. And we've seen a lot of it on, on uh, current account, uh, more recently on, on fiscal policy. But um, I wonder who are... Uh, you know, is there any research in the IMF that sort of pushes back against this revisionist thought uh, that has led to the guidelines? Are there holdouts uh, among uh, IMF economists who stick to the uh, to the old line of the 90s? Thanks. Let's answer these three, and then um, uh, and then we'll take a take another round. You want to start well, with the, the trade? The most favored nation. Um, I can't resist a first comment that I, I think it's one of the dumbest names that policymakers have ever come up with because it's, it's actually counterintuitive. Um, it makes it sound like somebody's getting the best deal. And what it means is you have to give me 
the, sa the, the most favored deal that you gave to anybody else. And so it does raise the bar to everybody, but it, it's really an equalization measure. It's not a most favored ne measure. But I, I, think you, I think the way you described it was essentially right. But I find it helpful to get away from the words and think about the um, uh, concept. Um, the reason I think this is really a legal question is there's a difference between what's written in the treaties, which is I'll give you 1% tariff or um, I won't um, prevent you know, foreign, depositor, foreign deposits or foreign banking services. Um, in that case, that would be subject to this equalizing treatment that you have to give the best deal to all your trading partners. But when, if you had to exercise one of the exceptions, if you um, had to impose, you mentioned a balance of payments crisis or impose that safeguard, your, um, you're taking an action under the treaty. You're not drafting the treaty. So you're allowed to take the action that's provided to you under the treaty. You do have to act in a way that is non-discriminatory among your trading partners. But um, it doesn't really come up that the, whether the uh, providing that, in, I guess uh, another way to look at your question, if you negotiate a treaty with me and it has a balance of payment safeguard in it, you're not required to include that safeguard in the treaty you may negotiate with SV. Her specific, so, uh, her specific I'm sorry, did I get to the question? What she specific? Yeah, you're definitely in the neighborhood, but I, I, I think I know <laughs> what she's trying to get at. And perhaps she, before she came here, she worked for the Colombian Central Bank, and she's learned that the United States trade treaty with the Colombians does not have a balance of payments right. exception, and it doesn't allow them to regulate right. uh, cross-border finance. However, with the South Koreans, the South Koreans somehow got a better deal with the United States and there's an annex that allows their deal, their particular law that allows them to put taxes on inflows. We, we can let the South Koreans do that. And so she's uh, an economist, not a lawyer, wants to make sure she understands that since both countries have to adhere by most favored nation, can Colombia say, hey, you let the South Koreans do this, uh, we can do it too. Is that your, that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah. Right. Not all uh, aspects of the treaty are subject to most favored nation. Um, I guess one way to look at it would be the specific, uh, the specific concessions that you make, um, your level of tariffs, um, whether you let in depositors, but some aspects of the of the treaty like whether there's an exception for BOP are are not part of most favored nation and i guess we'd really have to look at the precise provisions to um and i'm sure the lawyers in your country are are doing that in terms of um you know what they would have grounds to go back to the US and ask for that better deal um but I guess the short answer is, you, you no, you, not not the whole treaty. Hmm. Um, yeah. I'll try. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I will try to, to answer. I, I mean, to begin with the answer to Professor Boyle's uh, question. I mean, in, in terms of uh, what has happened, in ter uh, whether how can we solve this disagreement? No, I, I, I mean. Uh, in the past, I mean, until two, three years ago, was a huge agreement on capital account liberalization. I mean, the problem came with the crisis. I mean, this agreement came because Keynesians and you know, neoliberals are fighting each other to see where the mainstream policy will be in the future. So the, the, uh, the point is uh, developing countries or emerging markets uh, 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 are pushing to some extent to, to introduce this new, to some extent this new mainstream policy. I mean, w trying to be back at Keynesian years. Uh, that's for, for one part of, the, of your point. I mean, trying why, how to do with this disagreement. On terms of uh, how to, 
manage the crisis. I mean, coming from Argentina, but I mean, coming from the, the Latin America, but we'd say from all over the world. I mean, the point is, is there, there is no kind of uh, institutional setting for uh, bailing out a country. I mean, as Argentina showed in 2001, but also all the other countries. I mean, there is not uh, something equivalent to Chapter 11 uh, for films. The, the, that's the point that the, the, the project of at the IMF, by, uh, I mean, but the time Argentina was a, a, in the middle of the crisis, was not sorting out. I mean, so we just went to, you know, we have all the problems with the holdouts, etc. I mean, uh, and it reminds, the, the, the problem that remains is unsolved, I mean, to some extent. So uh, I just say that was beginning was your answer, one of your points, and now. <coughs> Let me add to that on the, I totally agree. There's a there's a big there's a big debate in economics about this. It's become much narrower than it was in the 1990s. And uh, so your question is, well, gosh, how 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 can you know since since there isn't a consensus on this stuff, how can the IMF have a clear, you know, why should it pick pick a side or something like that? What uh, what we've shown in this task force is that uh, that unfortunately certain countries um, have picked picked a side. Already, and the question, and the IMF isn't trying to pick a side. She's uh, the this institutional view are giving, are making sure countries have choices to do to make their own choice. But U.S. treaties are sort of stuck in the 1990s, and they they picked a side and said liberalization is optimal. It's more driven by the fact that U.S. firms want access to the markets, but it's it had in the 1990s an economic theory behind it that said, hey, capital account liberalization is an optimal thing. So the economists are saying it's a good thing, and all of the U.S. interests want it, and so let's go into a country and tell them they're crazy if they want any limits on this stuff. And so we signed all these treaties. The treaties have made that choice already, and now the economics is much more much more contentious. Uh, the preponderance of evidence on the econometrics of capital account liberalization and growth shows that countries that liberalize their capital accounts don't grow until they've hit a certain set of institutional thresholds. Most emerging market and developing countries are under that threshold. And uh, countries that liberalize their capital accounts are more prone to uh, banking crises. This is in the Rogoff and, uh, and Reinhardt stuff. Um, there's also a lot of new research by the IMF and by the NBER that shows that those countries that regulate cross-border financial, uh, cr regulate cross-border finance, that they've sh shown to have a statistically significant and important effect on, the, on these limits. So one, the regulations work, and two, full liberalization hasn't brought the benefits that we were shown in the 1990s uh, to deliver. And, and now there's even new theory. Um, some of the stuff has been co-authored with people at the, uh, at the IMF that, um, that thinks about financial markets in a public goods and second best framework where if uh, realizing that individual investors don't necessarily have the perfect information at their disposal to know uh, whether or not that their extra dollar borrowed or their extra dollar lent could be the one that could tip the scale and cause a crisis. And so it's a, it's a, it's a classic uh, market failure that, uh, that a intervention like a Brazil's tax on inflows is actually an optimal thing and not a distortion. And so there's been a lot of economic theory on that and simulations done that show that when countries put those things in, they'll actually grow faster because they'll be correcting for a distortion. That's, that's still controversial. The econometrics is not controversial. Um, it's all less controversial than it was in the 90s, but the U.S. has already, some treaties have uh, already made the choice of saying in the 1990s what our task force has, has exposed and um, and what comes out uh, in many of the, uh, in the, in the IMF institutional view, they have a quote in there, maybe you're going to read it, that says that a lot of these things are incompatible. They've made a choice that says you shouldn't regulate this stuff. And that's, uh, <clears throat> some people say it's right, some people say it's wrong. What, uh, what we're saying is a country should have the choice. Well, there's one more question from Cornell for you. Yeah, thanks. No, I, I think you presented that that very well. Um, I think that captures it. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you a precise name or any, anything, um, uh, but I was looking through the paper to see if, you know, some of the writers, some, uh, some of the research papers cited, you know, were flagged for, you know, representing the contrary view, and um, it's not immediately obvious. We'd, we'd have to look at it. But Austria is one of the um, people at the fund who writes a lot. And if you're interested in 
and looking at this, there's two sources. One is the papers that come out of the research department itself. And then there's this, and, and those papers represent, uh, are, well, the research department is more independent than some of the other departments which have to toe the party line. But even more independent are a set of staff papers that you know would be under a different tab on the website. And in that case, individual staff members have an opportunity to publish their own views. So those are two sources that you could look at to, to answer that question. Can I have a quick follow-up? No, 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 because I didn't let him have one either. <laughs> uh, let's have a couple more, and if there's room for you two to have a second question, we will. Sorry. I guess people want to hear what these two questions are. <laughs> oh, no, we have one here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I was curious, um, given uh, the current uh, climate post the financial crisis, uh, compared to the climate post the Asian financial crisis and the IMF's role uh, in both of those circumstances, uh, I, was, I was kind of curious about what the IMF is, uh, where it's directing itself in terms of its position in the world on these matters, um, given that uh, now you have a, up an apparent behavior change in terms of the acceptance of these, at least in terms of the institutional view and in part coming from parts within the IMF. Um, and I was curious, uh, the IMF is saying that it, it will not interfere with these treaties. Um, it will, it's, it's, is it just acting as a, an advisory capacity towards the future? Or I'm curious, I'm just curious because the IMF is uniquely situated in the world system to be where it could be uh, an international lender of last resort, it could be an international uh, regulator of, of types of things, and I'm curious if the IMF is moving closer to that or farther away given the rise of regional uh, possibilities such as in Asia uh, and elsewhere, and I'm just curious if you could speak to where the IMF sees itself moving forward in terms of capital account regulation. Okay, let's uh, see if there, are, if, there are, if there aren't other ones, we can go back to Zvi and, and Cornell. But I encourage other folks to ask questions. No? Okay, so Zvi and Cornell each had a uh, Mine is actually related to your question a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. You think this guy needs a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> they can hear him podcast it to China. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, my question is related to that question, and, and it's, uh, but it's more specific. And it relates to something that's in the news right now, credit default swaps on sovereign debt. Now, markets speak when it comes to credit default swaps. Everyone looks at how big the spread is to get an objective market-driven estimate of probability of default and severity of default. Uh, some national governments have decided to ban credit default swaps within their borders or naked credit default swaps. Now, of course, that's the supply. Uh, so if you ban the supply, you're essentially banning the market because they trump up some charge. Essentially, they don't want that market signal because it doesn't reflect well on their government. That would be one explanation, I think the only logical explanation for banning it. Uh, the IMF has come out and said, you can't do that. Or at least they are saying it's a bad thing. How does that get resolved? How does that relate to, let's take credit default swap. Is that a service? Okay, if I'm a market maker in credit default swaps, am I considered a service provider? Good question. Thank you, Deborah. I have an opposite question. It's more general. Um, do, you, do you have a theory of what it takes to change orthodoxy inside the IMF? Because this is, a, this is one of the few cases where we saw um, a, a half step, as, as some people put it, uh, but it's, it, is a, it is a departure from the 1990s. It is a qualified endorsement 
of some kind of intervention. What does it take to get there? You don't have to give names of institutions and so on, but in your perspective, what are the kind of uh, the kind of factors that can power a critical mass of people coming on the revisionist side and that leading up to uh, an official endorsement of that uh, revisionism that we are seeing now? Okay, we got to start with Nathan. Sure. Um, well, I'm going to say something that maybe ties together all three. Um, you mentioned the Asian crisis and then this crisis. Um, the fund has really evolved over that time. And it's, you know, we talk about the living constitution of the United States. I mean, the Articles of Agreement um, also have that ability to allow the fund to evolve as it needs to. You know, um, after World War II, when the fund and the World Bank were created, the international community had a particular view about capital transactions. And that's why there's certain language in the IMF articles that reflected that international view at the time. But there are other provisions in the IMF articles, and, I, and that's why I think it's so, talking about it, it's so important to look at the different functions and, and because there's different legal rules for all of them. So um, when the Asian crisis hit, I think it was a turning point in a lot, in causing the IMF to realize that it had to broaden its work. And um, it, uh, boy, some of us in the legal department had to learn something I had avoided at all costs in my private practice was learning bankruptcy law. And why that? Because if a country is in financial crisis and all the corporations are having difficulty and some of them are going insolvent and some of them are going out of business and the creditors are getting pinched, how are you going to resolve the economic crisis in the country unless you have an orderly system of insolvency and bankruptcy? So those of us, many, several of us had to learn bankruptcy law, and I did manage to ease out of that. <laughs> Other people worked on it. But it's, to me, it was very striking. I, you, know, you, know, you never thought that working in-house at the IMF, you'd have to learn about corporate bankruptcy law. And so um, another thing that came out of that was the beginning of attention to the financial sector. And that, of course, exploded in the more financial crisis. So I hope I'm remembering your exact question, but I think one, the, part, the first part of it was how did the work of the fund kind of change over time and get us to looking at these issues? And I'll come back to your other part in a minute. I think that answers a little bit the question in the back that part of it is the... Um, the development in the international global system. And um, then there's work uh, at the ministerial level, you know, the, um, the G7 and the G10, they issue communiques that say, IMF and World Bank, thou shalt look at these issues. So that's another way those issues come about. Uh, the evolution of thinking comes about um, in a more down-to-earth way when um, staff changes, new staff comes in. The IMF made some um, real efforts to get more of a um, rotation of staff to um, find ways to help people who are thinking they'd like to move on that you know, economically from their pension standpoint, there wasn't a disincentive to do that. And at the same time, there was a hiring of new expertise. And that gets back to this other question up front that, um, you know, I saw a change in my department and in other departments that um, they hiring lawyers who came from the banking divisions of their law firms. And we never had that in the first 10 years I was there. Um, so, um, 
it, it, it change, you know, it changes as the world economy changes. And so in terms of how the IMF is looking at what they should do on capital controls, um, there's a couple of parts of this paper that I think, you know, are address that head on. And, um, you know, let me just read the first couple of sentences of this executive summary. It says, capital flows have increased significantly in recent years and are a key aspect of the global monetary system. They offer potential benefits to countries, but their size and volatility can also pose policy challenges. The fund needs to be in a position to provide clear and consistent advice with respect to capital flows and policies related to them. In 2011, the International Monetary and Financial Committee, which is made up of, at the ministerial level, called for further work on comprehensive, flexible, and balanced approach for the management of capital flows. And then, um, you know, later on in this paper, it talks about how the IMF is going to think about capital flows in its surveillance function. And at this stage, that's largely on the level of policy advice. So um, that's why I said it's, it's not going to advise countries to conflict with their obligations under the free trade agreement. But the, you know, if reading the institutional view and, and there's a really good, you know, it's, it's, which box has a, it's in a box in this paper. It's, it's so strongly emphasizes the need to look at the circumstances and that different measures might be appropriate in different circumstances. And, you know, maybe there's some that are, you know, you look to avoid or you're really the least desirable because the two issues why a measure may be considered undesirable is, is it really going to be effective? Does and is it going to achieve what, you know, so is it going to be effective and achieve what you want to achieve? And actually, is it, is compliance assured? Because some of the measures that are imposed are very leaky. So there may be reasons why some measures are lower down on the hierarchy of the possible range of measures to be um, recommended. But, you know, the paper, this paper couldn't have been clearer, I think, that the thrust of it is to consider the circumstances. Here's a set of guidelines that our experience shows us might be the best way, approach in those circumstances, but nothing is set in stone. This view does not set anything in stone. Yeah, so I don't know. I think I've touched on everybody's question. I don't know if I've answered it to the full extent. Yeah, okay. Thanks. On the credit, credit default swaps, I mean, in, in Neither the fund work nor our task force, and I think most of the economics would show that uh, when it comes to capital flows and the systemic risk, the credit to swap, the fault swaps are not, uh, they are not causing any of this risk. They might indicate how risky a country is. Um, and so this report is looking at, uh, in, in terms of derivatives, foreign exchange derivatives are, are definitely a channel that have been identified in some of the fund reports and that we look at and that some countries have uh, some countries have regulated. So Brazil has limits on positions that you can take on, on dollar positions. And South Korea has a uh, tax on foreign exchange positions to try to slow that down. Um, so the CDS market will pick, pick that up if they see that being risky, but this isn't a target of the regulation. Now, there are uh, lots of other reports like this that are looking, uh, we're looking at one tiny little uh, piece, right? cross-border financial regulations and the trading system. But there is a larger debate in the New York legal community and in the legal profession in general about financial regulatory reform and trade commitments. And so that is where there are lots of New York law firms that have little pieces about the naked swap bans and so, far, so forth in Europe and the FTT, the financial tra transactions tax, and the extent to which that violates uh, their commitments. We don't deal with that here. That's not in the IMF. Piece. This is this is on cross-border financial regulation related for for booms and busts, not uh, you know not general financial reform. And there's major debates. And yes, if you're uh, yes, if I ban if I have a ban on naked swaps, um, 
and I have made mode one and mode three commitments without any limits for new financial regulation that might come up 10 years down the road because I might have a crisis, then I am fundamentally in violation. Um, so the question because then are these of two treaties. of those treaties, right, <clears throat> of those treaties, but uh, the question is um, no one's tested whether a CDS can get through the balance of payments exception or the uh, prudential exception. And so there's a big debate. Some New York law firms say that the prudential exception is too big, you can drive a truck through it. And so every regulation that uh, everybody from Argentina to the Germans, uh, <coughs> if that's a spectrum, that, they, that they'll come up with, uh, you know, you can get anything through there, whereas it should be uh, more narrow. But we, we don't, that's not really part of the economics or the, or the policy that we're looking at here. If I might just say one thing, inject, whoop, inject a thought, and that is traditionally capital regulation has looked at cross-border flows of funds. But from a modern finance perspective, cross-border flows of risk transfer through guarantees, whether private or public sector, are just as important and inseparable mm -hmm. in many ways because they affect the flows. Mm -hmm. well, it's it's, it's 130. 134, so we went four minutes off. Uh, thanks again for all of you for coming. Thanks for the, to the uh, Center for Finance, Law, and Policy and the Part E Center for coming together and bringing us all together. If you want to talk more about taking stock on the financial crisis, uh, go to the conference at SMG. And please uh, especially uh, thank our, our two visitors to Boston University today, Deborah Siegel and Leonardo Stanley.